Welcome to the second lecture on material properties. In this lecture, we're going to cover some real-world applications of material properties and do several different mathematical example problems to show you how material properties is applied to statics problems. Let's start off with another example problem about my favorite material, concrete. Let's look at how tall a six-inch cylinder of concrete could be before it failed under its own weight. We know that the compressive strength of concrete from our previous lecture is 5,000 psi. We know that the density of concrete is 150 pounds per cubic foot. So take a minute and work this problem out to figure out how tall you could make a cylinder of concrete before it failed under its own weight. So the way that you work this problem out is to do the following. You'll take the density of concrete, multiply it by the volume of concrete, and then divide it by the area. And this will end up equaling the compressive strength of concrete. So what we do is we take our density, which is 150 pounds per cubic foot. We multiply that by 27 inches squared, which we're just assuming is our cross-sectional area, multiplied by the height because we're looking at a cylinder. So it's the area of a circle times its height is the volume of a cylinder. And we divide this by the cross-sectional area. Well, the area, as you see, 27 inches squared, cancels out. So the size of the cylinder or shape of concrete you have ends up being irrelevant. What we can now do is set that equal to the compressive strength of concrete, which is 5,000 pounds per inch squared. But really what we have to do is because on the left side now we've got pounds per cubic foot, times height. We can't have pounds per square inch on the right side. We need to convert that to be 144 inches squared per foot squared so that we've got everything in like units, pounds per foot. Ultimately what this tells us is that concrete could stand 4,800 feet on top of itself before it actually failed. So that's almost one mile high. This is why concrete is considered to be such an amazing material in compression. I mean, think about that. And when you, when you look at the examples of structures that are built with concrete, you'll see some pretty impressive structures. One impressive structure made primarily out of concrete is the Bixby Bridge in Big Sur, California, which passes right along the Pacific Coast Highway Route 1. Now I've driven that road all the way from San Francisco to San Diego and from San Francisco to Seattle and I can say it's one of the most beautiful roads and all sorts of great travel stories along that road so highly recommend it. But take a look at the geometry of this bridge and keep that in mind as we go to the next structures built out of concrete. Another very impressive structure built out of concrete is the Hoover Dam in Nevada slash Arizona. Well we can see that it's 80 plus years old now and it stands 722 feet tall, which if you remember, is actually taller than the Golden Gate Bridge and definitely taller than the Washington Monument. So it's a truly impressive structure. And when you think about all of the weight of water that it's holding back, it's holding back lots and lots of force. And think about the shape and geometry of a dam before we move to the next structure. Here we have the beautiful Pantheon in Rome, which was built over 1900 years ago and is still standing. Now what you can see here is that this structure is made primarily out of Roman concrete and it's lasted for two millennia, pretty much. Now going back to our idea of safety factor, if we just said that a concrete structure could be over one mile tall on its own before it failed, if you look at the Pantheon, it's nowhere close to that. So the safety factor of the compressive strength of this material is really, really high. And that's why all of the ancient structures in the world, the Great Pyramids, the Parthenon in Greece, the Pantheon in Rome, still stand today. It's because they're made out of stone and concrete. And those materials have very high compressive strength. And the engineers back in even this day understood how good this material was in compression and designed their structures specifically to handle those compressive forces. And something that you'll see that all three of these different structures had in common was one thing. They all make you want to go to McDonald's. I'm kidding. They all contain arches. Let me show you another example of a beautiful structure that exhibits this exact principle using concrete and stone right in our own backyards.
I'm at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. to show you the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, which is a truly impressive and beautiful church. This structure here is made of concrete and stone, which as I've explained, are both materials that are extremely good in compression. As you can see, the structure is adorned with a beautiful dome, which given concrete and stone's ability to be in compression, we've discussed how arches are a natural structural formation that allow every element of that structure to be in compression. A dome is just a three-dimensionally revolved version of an arch and is not only incredibly strong and long-lasting, but also beautiful. And you can see that represented here in this structure, as well as timeless structures like the Pantheon all around the world and throughout history. Now we'll do a quick review of the material we covered in last lecture and apply this to several different example problems. Last time we talked about Young's modulus and how the equation for Young's modulus is stressed out guy over a strainer or stress over strain. What's pretty cool about Young's modulus is not only does it represent the stiffness of a material, but you can actually rearrange the equation in a particular way to get the following. You get that the change in length is equal to PL over EA or PLE. You can also change that P to an F, and oftentimes I'll say that change in length is equal to FLE, FL over EA. What this tells you is that you can, knowing Young's modulus for material and the loads that it's subjected to and how much cross-sectional area you have, you can figure out how much material will either stretch or compress when loads are applied to it. Now you might look at this equation here and you might think, this is brand new material, you've never seen it before, but actually you definitely have. This is pretty much just a more advanced and realistic version of spring forces. When you look at a spring, you know that spring force is F equals K times X. You usually say that K is the spring constant. It's how stiff your spring is. The stronger your K, the more force you need to apply to your spring to stretch it out. Well, the same exact thing is true in Young's modulus. Right, Young's modulus is just a more advanced version of the spring constant for materials, not just springs. And when you look at the equation as well, you'll also see that there's like mass. Like a force is what stretches the spring. Well, a force is also what stretches your materials as well. The difference between a spring and a normal material is that pretty much you care about the initial length, which is what you care about in a spring, but you also care about the cross-sectional area of the material. Because the more material you have, you can imagine the harder it's going to be to stretch it because you've got more stuff to stretch. Now let's look at how we can apply this equation to a real life problem. In this question here, what we're gonna do is take this bar, which has 8,000 pounds of tension pulling on either side. It's five inches long initially, and we're told how much it stretches. The question we're asked is to figure out what is Young's modulus for this material. So let me jump to a handwritten solution and show you how to apply this equation and solve this problem. Let's take a look at this problem. The problem explains that we have a bar here. It's subject to 8,000 pounds of tension. It has a length of five inches initially and a cross-sectional area of 0 0.6 inches squared. We're asked that if the bar stretches 0 0.0025 inches to determine the modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus of the material, E. And we're told that the material has linear elastic behavior, which we've explained or will demonstrate in the graphs in this lecture. So, in this particular problem, we use the definition of Young's modulus, which is that E, and I'll do it over here, which is that E is equal to sigma over epsilon, which really means that it's stress over strain. This means that it's the force the material is experiencing over the area, and we know that the equation for strain is the change in length over the initial length of the material. Well, we have all of these things here, so this is going to lead us to the fact that the material is exerted under 8,000 pounds of tension. So we've got 8,000 pounds as our force. The area of our material is given as 0 0.6 inches squared, so we plug in 0 0.6 inches squared, and then we divide by the change in length over the initial length, which is our strain. We're told that the bar stretches 0 0.0025 inches, so our change in length is 0 0.0025 inches, 
divided by the initial length, which was 5 inches. When we do all these calculations out here, we will find that E is equal to 2.67 times 10 to the 4th KSI. Now, the reason that the units come out as KSI is because initially we had had 8,000 pounds per square inch. So realistically, when you do this calculation here, you'll get PSI. But I converted the units to be in KSI because that's what this question on Master Engineering asked for. But the interesting thing about strain is that, remember, strain is unitless. Because we have the change in length over the initial length, this bottom piece has no units. They cancel out. It's essentially a percentage. So as a result, we get that Young's modulus is the units of stress. And in this case, we get PSI, which we then convert to KSI. Here you go. One other important distinction we need to make before we move on is this idea of axial versus transverse strain. What axial strain represents is along the axial length of the material. So when I pull or compress the material, it's going to stretch or get shorter in length. But in addition to getting longer or shorter, the material's cross-section is also going to be impacted. And that's measured by transverse strain. And what transverse strain represents is a change in diameter of a material. Now you can imagine that when I pull a material, the diameter will get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it fails. But if I squish a material, the material will actually balloon out and get wider at the cross-section. So it's going to be important to understand the relationship between axial and transverse strain as we move forward. And the way that we mathematically relate axial and transverse strain is with Poisson's ratio. What Poisson's ratio measures is the transverse strain over the axial strain. And if we look at this cube system down here, it's kind of showing you change in length, which is going to be the axial distance, and change in length prime which is kind of the change in diameter. So effectively what transverse strain is going to be is change in diameter over initial diameter divided by the axial strain which is change in length over initial length. What's pretty cool about Poisson's ratio is it kind of helps you understand how stretchy a material is and it's very much related to Young's modulus in a way. If you look at a very very stretchy material at the top rubber it has a very high Poisson's ratio, which is basically saying that the diameter is going to change quite a bit as you stretch it. If you look at an example of a material with a very low Poisson's ratio, the one at the very, very bottom is cork. As you pull on cork, the diameter doesn't change at all. It just snaps right in half. So brittle materials tend to have a very low Poisson's ratio, whereas very stretchy or plastic materials have a very high Poisson's ratio. And what's very interesting to observe is that volume actually isn't conserved. If you did the, the math out and you said, okay, if I stretch this material this much, how much cross-section would you have? You'd actually find that the volume of the material that you have would not match what you had initially. And the reason why is that as you stretch the material, the materials inside of that system rearrange and actually tend to get denser as you pull the system apart. So it's actually very, very interesting to find out that volume isn't conserved. That's just a pretty fun fact, in my opinion. Let's now look at an example of how we can apply Poisson's ratio and how it's used in an ENES 102 problem. So let's look at this problem right here and jump to a handwritten solution and explain it a little bit more. Now let's take a look at this question here. We're told that we have a plastic rod made of acrylic, that it's 200 millimeters long, and has a diameter of 10 millimeters. We're told that if it has an axial load of P equals 450 newtons, which will be tension applied to it, we're asked to determine the change in the length of the material. We're given that the Young's modulus of the material E is 2.7 GPA, which that would be a very bad GPA, just kidding. That's gigapascal, so 10 to the ninth. And then we've got VP, which is Poisson's ratio, is 0.4. The second part of the question we're asked to do is determine the change in diameter of this material. Because we know that if we stretch this material this way, the diameter is going to whoop, shrink. So let's figure out what we need to do. We will start off 
with the equation for Poisson's ratio, which we know is negative strain transverse over the axial strain, which if we simplify this or break it down, we get that the transverse strain is the change in diameter over the initial diameter of the shape and that the strain in the axial direction is the change in length over the initial length. So we can rewrite this equation to be the change in diameter times the initial length over the change in length times the diameter naught. So we've kind of just simplified things and neatened up our equation. So we've got this is for Poisson's ratio. Now I'm not going to use this right away, but we'll come back to this. The next thing I want to write is an equation for the change in length. Now this comes from manipulating, uh, sorry, this comes... Now I want to write an equation for change in length. This comes from a manipulation of Young's modulus equation. So this is going to get us F times L over E times A. Flee. So we actually know everything in this equation already. We know the force the rod is subjected to. It's 450 newtons. We know the initial length of the rod is 200 millimeters. We know the Young's modulus of our material is 2.7 GPA. And here's a trick right now. Because I'm working with newtons and millimeters, I'm going to want to convert E to be megapascals. So I'm going to go up here and look, and 2.70 GPA is really equal to 2.7 times 10 to the ninth pascals. So if I want to convert this to megapascals, then what this is going to give me is 2.7 times 10 to the third megapascals. So I'll plug that down into here for E. 2.70 times 10 to the third megapascals times the cross-sectional area, which we're given the diameter is 10 millimeters. So we'll use our equation for area pi over 4 times 10 millimeters squared. So we take everything over here. What we'll get out of this equation is the following, which is 90,000 divided by 21,000, or maybe 212,000, sorry, my comma is in a weird spot, and 57. So this gets us a value of 0 0.424 millimeters. So the first question, which was determine the change in length of the rod is what we just did. So this is change in length. And just to reiterate, this change in length equation came from Young's modulus, which says that force over area over change in length divided by initial length. So you can see here that all of our equations are manipulated and uh, all of our variables come out in this equation that we had over here. Now, what I can do is I can use the equation I started off with for Poisson's ratio, and I can solve for this change in diameter. So initially, this equation had two unknowns, which was the change in diameter and the change in length. Because we've now just solved for the change in length, I can go and use this to solve for change in diameter. So I can rearrange this equation here so that I get that change in diameter is equal to Poisson's ratio times change in length times initial diameter divided by the initial length L0. So when I plug in all of my numbers, I get that Poisson's ratio is given to us as 0.4. I get that the change in length over initial length was 0.424 divided by the initial length of 200 millimeters times the initial diameter which we're told the initial diameter was 10 millimeters. So what we get out of this is that the change in diameter is 0 0.00848 millimeters. And this is going to be a shrink or decrease in diameter because we're stretching the rod and as I explained before, when you stretch the rod this way, 
material will get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it snaps in the middle. So this is our change in diameter. We say that it shrinks or decreases in size. One or the other is totally acceptable. And that's it, that's this question. So really, what you need to know about problems with Poisson's ratio is that you'll usually need to relate the change in length to the change in diameter using your equation for Poisson's ratio up here, which is why I started with that, so we knew where we needed to go. So that's this question. Now what we'll do is combine everything we've learned in material properties, Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, deformation, and we'll apply it to an Aeneas 102 statics problem. Let's look at this question right here, which is a good old construction worker sitting on a beam, which is, looks pretty dangerous, I'm not really sure what's below him, but he's sitting on a beam, ABC, there's a cable DE holding everything together, and the question that we're asked here is to, to see how much the cable stretches in this question. So this is like a perfect example of how material properties can be applied to an Aeneas 102 or statics problem. So I'm going to jump to a handwritten solution now and show you how to do this type of problem. Let's take a look at this problem here. What we've got is a man sitting on the end of a beam that's attached to a wall with a pin that's supported by a cable ED. We're told that this wire has a diameter of 5 millimeters and is made from A36 steel. And we're told that the man has a mass of 88 kilograms. And the question is asking us to determine the elongation of the wire DE, assuming that E, or Young's modulus for the wire, is 200 GPA, which, man, that'd be a sweet GPA. But again, that's just gigapascals. So how do we go about solving this problem? Well, what we need to first do is we need to figure out the incline of this cable right here. And then we'll draw our free body diagram. So what I did to start everything off was I just drew some similar triangles. So to find theta here, I drew the triangle 600-800 for the height and width and found that the hypotenuse was 1000. What this means, if you look at the ratios here, is that we have a 3-4-5 triangle. So now I have enough information to draw the free body diagram. And I'll do that now. Now that I've done the free body diagram of our beam, ABC, what I'm able to do is do some of the forces to solve for the tension in cable TDE. The most logical way to do this would be to do a sum of the moments about point A. Because I don't know TDE, I don't know AX, and I don't know AY, but I do know W. So by taking the moment about a point with two unknowns, I'll make my life easier. So now I'll write the moment equation out. So I've now written the sum of the moments about point A, and you get 3 fifths TDE, which is the Y component of TDE, times 800, which is this distance here, which will cause things to rotate counterclockwise. Then you'll subtract the weight of the man times the distance of him to the pivot point, which is 1400 millimeters, and he causes things to rotate clockwise, so we say that that's negative. Given the fact that W of the man is his mass, 88 kilograms, times 9.81 meters per second squared, we can complete this calculation and find that the tension in the rope of TDE is equal to 2,518 newtons. Now in a normal statics problem, we would be done. But now what we need to do is combine this with material properties to answer the question, which is what's the elongation of the wire? Well, we know that the formula for change in length is equal to Fli, which is the force in the wire times the initial length of the wire divided by Young's modulus of the material times the cross-sectional area. So we now know everything we need to know right here. The tension in our cable is 2,518 newtons. Young's modulus for our material is 200 gigapascals, which is 200 times 10 to the 9th pascals. The initial length of our wire was one, millimeter, uh, one meter, so I'm just going to put one meter here. Technically it was 1,000 millimeters. We could do everything out here in, in millimeters, but I'm just going to do it in meters. So I've converted this to one meter and I've made sure that this is in pascals. So when I do the area of this cable, I don't want to use a diameter of five millimeters. I want to use the diameter of 0 0.005 meters. Ultimately, it's up to you. As long as you're consistent with your units, it all's gonna work out. 
but I figured I would do one a little bit differently so you get to see how you could do the problem. So now what I'll do is multiply by the area down here, which is pi over 4 times the diameter, which is 0 0.005 meters squared. And what we get for the change in length of our cable, DE, is 6.4 times 10 to the negative fourth meters. Or if we want to rewrite that a little bit, we get that change in length is equal to 0 0.641 millimeters. So as you can see in this problem here, the way that we'll begin to use stress and strain and material properties and statics questions is we'll set up a statics problem similar to this. You'll do the basic statics, the sum of the moments, the sum of the forces that you always do, and then you'll apply kind of the new concepts you've learned with material properties. And what this is ultimately doing is it's giving you a more complete picture of what's happening to these structural systems. As now we not only understand, you know, what's the tension in that wire, but we understand the repercussions of that tension and what happens. Ultimately, had we known more about yield stress or safety factors or things like that, we could go even farther with this problem and figure out if this particular condition is actually acceptable or not. That's it for today's lecture. Hopefully now you can take all the things you learned conceptually about material properties and you can apply them to real world examples and problems that you'll see in ENES 102. I'll see you all next time. Sorry everyone, there's no corny jokes at the end of this lecture. <laughs>